Well, thank you very much indeed, Dale. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for coming tonight. It's a great pleasure to be with you in what turns out to be an extraordinarily appropriate venue. Now, you may not associate bankers with ethical culture, <laughs> but what I propose to do this evening is to introduce you to a banker who was steeped in ethical culture and who I feel would have got on very well with Felix Adler, also a German-born Jew, who of course called this society into being. I want to begin by asking a very fundamental question, uh, and that relates to how many of you know uh, who Siegmund Warburg was. My guess is that it's only a minority of you who had heard of him uh, before this evening. Uh, his name is much better known in London, uh, where indeed he spent most of his financial career. But that's not really a sufficient explanation for the relative obscurity in New York of a man who was without question one of the towering figures of post-war world finance. I think the key has to do with our neglect of bankers as a fit subject for biography. <laughs> Why write the biography of a banker as opposed, say, to a dictator or perhaps a great democratic leader, a prime minister, or a president? Why write the biography of a banker when you could be writing the biography of a king or a princess or an actress? In order to show you how we attach importance to different kinds of historical figure, I want to show you some statistics. If you go, as I did recently, to the British Library's General Reference Collection catalogue, and simply find out how many books have been written about these different people, you will be rather startled by the result. Hitler is the clear winner. Uh, 478 books appear in that catalogue about Adolf Hitler, pipping Stalin uh, to the post for most storied dictator. Mussolini comes in with the bronze medal edging out Mao. Winston Churchill, I'm afraid, uh, beats your own Abraham Lincoln. But don't feel bad, because Churchill was, of course, half American. <laughs> Henry VIII is the most written about royal. Uh, he has 90 books about him. Uh, Diana, Princess of Wales, is quite a distant second on 39. Notice that that's only one more than Marilyn Monroe. But when we get to bankers, it's as if the biographers suddenly leave the library in embarrassment. There are two or maybe three books about Siegmund Warburg, three if you count Ron Chernow's uh, book about the entire Warburg family, uh, two if you only count my book, and Jacques Attali's biography of Warburg, an unusual book. Uh, Jacques Attali, incidentally, was for many years François Mitterrand's close confidant. Uh, it's an unusual book because um, it's a biography exclusively based, as far as I can tell, on the imagination. <laughs> my, my book is based on uh, reading my way through about 10,000 letters uh, and diary entries and memoranda uh, which Warburg kept. Uh, in the course of his life. Unlike many financiers, I should explain, Warburg was uh, a remarkably prolific writer. And that, for a biographer, is a huge advantage. Now, I don't really know quite why you would need to ask the question, uh, why bankers? When you reflect on the events of the last three years, uh, it should be obvious that bankers are historically important. 
and I would go so far as to say, more important than actresses. <laughs> Perhaps even more important than princesses. For if anything has shaped our lives in the last three years, it's been a financial crisis, which many people are inclined to blame entirely on bankers. Now, I'm not one of those people who thinks that bankers are solely responsible for a crisis that clearly was caused by a whole coalition of negligent groups, regulators, rating agencies, not forgetting the politicians who did so much to stoke the real estate bubble. But still, you would have a difficult job, I think you'll agree, writing the history of the last decade and leaving out Goldman Sachs. I'll take Goldman uh, as an example, but it's just an example. I could equally well have taken any of the major financial institutions that have played such a dominant role in modern economic history. It has to be historically significant that on the eve of the crisis, the chief executive of Goldman Sachs was being paid 2,000 times the average income in this country. It has to be significant that a bank had net revenues greater than the gross domestic product of more than 100 countries. And it has to be significant that that institution, at a time of financial crisis, not only converted itself into a bank holding company from an investment bank, but also secured indirectly a bailout a via the bailout of AIG at a time when the Treasury Secretary was the former chief executive officer of that bank. Call me cranky, but I just think that's historically important. <laughs> For some reason, Lloyd Blankfein's picture had disappeared from that last slide I showed you, which makes me feel slightly uneasy. I wonder what else has been removed <laughs> and by whom. When Lloyd Blankfein was challenged by the Sunday Times in a now famous interview last year. He replied, ironically, I think, uh, that he was just doing God's work, but public reaction, certainly in, in Britain, was not, I think, to detect the irony. And the fact that the bank then had to settle with the SEC for some $550 million uh, to settle fraud charges tells you something very important about about our times, about the bankers. When Rolling Stone magazine called Goldman Sachs the great vampire squid, I think that was a historically significant moment. I think that's a quotation that will appear in the history books. Another one that ought to appear is John Mack's famous declaration, which I heard him make. He made it in New York. We cannot control ourselves. You have to step in and control the street. I was stunned when I heard him say that, though I suppose in some ways it was better than claiming to be doing God's work. <laughs> the collapse of public confidence, of public trust in bankers, is one of the most striking features of our time. Uh, if you look at opinion uh, data, bankers are now less trusted by the public than journalists. <laughs> and that takes some doing. I'm a historian, that's why I'm so engaged with and committed to the New York Historical Society. And what historians are best at doing is taking documents, the things that people leave behind, and making historical sense of them. Before I talk at all about Siegmund Warburg, I want to juxtapose his ethos, the financial ethos of his generation, with the ethos of the present generation. And there is no document that does this better, in my view, than the email correspondence of Fab Fabrice Tour, Goldman Sachs trader and Ubermensch. <laughs> These emails, which were written to a, a quite large number of different girlfriends, um, he was diversified in that respect. <laughs> As in so many others, are, I think, a better summation of the spirit of our age than any other document you could possibly find. <laughs> 